Are you more often sad than happy in your marriage? Are you tired of the conflict and stress and heartache? Have you exhausted that catchphrase, marriage is supposed to make you holy, not happy? Do you want to get out of the rewarded cycle because you've discovered that after spinning your wheels inside of that cliche for years, you feel more unloved and lonely than ever? Do you emotionally flatline and you're ready to give up in spite of counseling and having read all the books on being the most excellent wife that you can be and after all these years you understand what marriage is supposed to look like yet there's just more isolation and disconnection. If that sounds like your marriage you have come to the right spot. Hi there my name is Lily and, and here I talk about conflicted marriages and how God has made a distinct connection for himself through your femininity so that he can heal your feminine heart and give you back your life and possibly the marriage you've always hoped for. The reason I say possibly is because there's a warning that you'll have to pay attention to. As you grow in your femininity shines brighter and you get stronger in the Lord, a true believing brother will love who you're becoming, but a wolf in sheep's clothing will hate your new sense of self. As God regenerates your heart, mind, and soul to be the daughter he meant for you to be at your conception, the wolf will make your marriage worse. Are you ready to have the truth exposed? Are you ready to discover if your husband is a wounded guy who makes the marriage difficult, or if he's a man that's actually really dangerous to you. In this video, I want to press into the way Christianity has neglected femininity, leading to a distorted view of female sexuality and the creation of dutiful mindsets. And how, because we don't label it as breadcrumbing, this distorted view is the reason why so many faithful and dedicated wives struggle to realize that they're being breadcrumbed instead of being cleaved to. It could be an unconscious display of stinginess, self-centeredness, or relational laziness from a husband, or it could be deliberately abusive. The important thing to remember is that whether it's intentional or not, it's always going to have a destructive effect on your heart. I'm going to cover that there are needs and desires that are unique to women, but are often overlooked or misunderstood. I want to talk about the impact of estrogen on emotional experiences and the importance of attachment and connection for us women. I'm going to contrast how the ratios of estrogen to testosterone affect arousal and sexual desire and how those ratios create different emotional capacities for men and women and why the words do benevolence in 1 Corinthians 7 means something totally different for a woman than it does for a man. So let's go. When you begin to understand that breadcrumbs are a substitute for a true cleaving that's supposed to be happening in a one flesh relationship and that you've been conditioned to accept this substitution, it's going to help you heal yourself. Because by accepting breadcrumbs, I know for me, it was the proof to me that I didn't understand the femininity that God had created me with. I didn't see just how much value my femininity has and how it was important to my life. And if we don't understand our value and preciousness, that means, one, we can't authentically embrace who we are as his daughters. And two, if we don't see how high the value is, we won't protect that inside ourselves. We won't be able to guard our feminine hearts, right? Because we don't protect what's not valuable. And three, we won't be able to accept all our female needs and desires that are required for us to engage in a relationship with one of God's sons. All those feminine needs that are due to you are just as imperative as the masculine needs that are due to him. The primary need for femininity is connection and attachment. 
Well, that's important for all of us, but when it comes to the one flesh relationship, it's imperative to females because estrogen is our primary operating system and that's where all those feelings and emotions are that support connection and attachment. When you read the words, affection do her, from 1 Corinthians 7, what do you think of? If you think of intercourse instead of attachment and connection, that means you're thinking in your masculine mindset. You're interpreting 1 Corinthians 7 like a man. Men, not all, but most, see that portion of scripture as only intercourse. But it's not. Not for us girls. In theory, we say we know that men and women are different, right? Yet, in practical approaches, we don't live that out. 1 Corinthians 7 is a perfect example of this disconnect. How can the due benevolence be the same for a man as it is for a woman if men and women are different? And not just a little different. When you look at the ratios for our sex hormones, the composition of estrogen to testosterone is contrasted to each other. And this is why I use the contrasted ratio of 90-10 when I'm talking about the sex hormones. It's not exact, especially when it comes to females. Our testosterone levels are more complex than males, but it's common biological knowledge that men are made up of way, way more testosterone than women. I was listening to a podcast just the other day um, on Diary of a CEO, and the guest had said that men have 17 times more testosterone than women. That's a lot. So yes, intercourse is part of it for us, but in order for us to want to have sex the way a man does, because of all his testosterone, right? That's where the tremendous sex drive comes from. Isn't it kind of intellectually dishonest to expect a woman to have an identical biological sex drive when her sex hormones of testosterone are contrary to a man's hormones at the ratio of approximately 17 times less? She simply doesn't have the tools necessary for that kind of drive. Our drive comes through all our estrogen not our testosterone. It's the same, but different. Here's a great example of the same, but completely different. When you consider the nerve endings on each of our sexual organs, a man has the same amount on the end of his penis as a woman does on her clitoris. Think about that for a second. We both have about 8,000 nerve endings in those areas, but look at the difference in size. And when it comes to relationship and emotions, a man's feelings and emotional capacity, they're very different than ours. It's experienced the opposite way from ours because his estrogen levels are way, way less. So with the way testosterone functions, it's so powerful that all that aggression from his 90% testosterone sits over top of his 10% estrogen. It's hidden. That's why the emotional experience of attachment and connection is low on a man's radar. It doesn't surface until after ejaculation. Remember, men work first, then experience feel-good emotions of all that oxytocin being released in their body. Because we've only got 10% testosterone and our primary operating hormone is estrogen, in super high levels, that means what we feel has to come first for us. We've got to feel good in our mind and heart and soul in order to respond with matching cognitive action, and in this case, having sex. A woman can only experience that increased rush of her version of the 90% testosterone when the masculine cleaves to her feminine. All that desire for sex has to be created through our feelings and emotions. Experiencing masculine cleaving is a requirement. It's not a wish or an option or a request. 
It's a biological necessity in order to keep your feminine healthy. But what has happened is that almost all Christian teaching on marriage has reframed sexuality to be a functional role for wives instead of it being the culmination of a one flesh relationship. Their perspective is identical to Nike's motto, just do it. See, this is masculine thinking. Men can have sex with anyone, relatively speaking. He doesn't have to even like a female or be attracted to her and he can have sex with her. The proof of that is the porn addiction is primarily a male problem. And I'm not talking about whether he should or in any sense of morality. I'm just speaking in terms of human biology. The aggression in testosterone is rather indiscriminate. Estrogens befriend and tend does not work that way. Women are very discriminating because we've got so much estrogen. But Christianity has completely neglected this huge biological and polarity difference in favor of making a female live her entire existence in marriage through the functional role of a wife. The shepherds have done untold damage to the daughters of God. And they've neutered her emotions and feelings through invalidation and they've masculinized her heart. But worse than that is the impact of living in a fallen, savage world, completely unguarded, unprotected, and untaught. In part three, I had said that almost all Christian marriage teaching has sent women the unspoken message that once she gets married, her feminine characteristics as a woman, all of her emotions and feelings become less significant and what becomes <clears throat> important are aspects such as respect and submission and fulfilling the duties within the role of a wife. Conversely, there's no similar emphasis on the relevance of masculinity for husbands. In fact, after marriage, the husband is pictured above the wife in their hierarchical structure. So what happens is that the reality of her sex becomes an echo of the man's. The outcome and primacy of the marriage is now that the masculine desire is the need for sex. What the female needs in order for her body to respond with sex is exchanged for duty. And her desire is not her need anymore. Her desire is now supposed to be his demand. Without that relationship connection that is supposed to happen during cleaving as a prelude to intercourse, a woman's desire for sex is not kindled and it cannot be. Her feminine need, her desire is disappeared underneath his demand and her feminine need, her due benevolence, is circumvented into an obligation of a single act of duty in response to the husband's demand. When we interpret 1 Corinthians 7 in only one way, the masculine interpretation, it's disingenuous. God knows there's two different polarities here because he's the one who created them. God doesn't mean there's only one action here. There isn't just one act of intercourse. There's two completely different creature needs here. Rendering to the wife is the ongoing process of cleaving to her. That's what the word do means. It's the word ophilo. It's giving with the idea of accruing for yourself. And doesn't that sound a lot like how a husband is supposed to love himself through loving his wife? God is saying, if you, husband, are always cleaving to your wife, it will accrue to you so that whenever you want sex, her body will respond. But that's not the message that the shepherds send to Christian wives. They've twisted it to send the unspoken message that if they don't feel like sex, they're told that they should feel like sex. And if they don't, they should pretend that they do, that they should make their bodies 
pretend they're being cleaved to, to just start doing it and the feeling will follow. That's a masculine interpretation. It's a man that does good then feels good. It's the complete opposite for a feelings-based creature. Can you see how destructive that is to the way God designed his daughter's femininity to be embodied? Wives are told to live in self-deception whenever they're taught to give sex to their husband because his masculinity needs it. Even though her husband hasn't been contributing his masculinity to her femininity through the one flesh relationship. When it comes to a one flesh relationship, feeling like a female is what's most important to a woman. And she feels like a woman when she experiences attachment that's made through the connection of being cleaved to. Being cleaved to is the literal magic formula for true, healthy, feminine arousal. There's nothing else. There's one time in a month that a woman might desire sex like a man, like overtly like that. It's when she's ovulating, but that's the exception. Can a woman make herself aroused? Yes. It's called faking it. And every woman listening here knows exactly what I mean. You know, there's two other words for the expectation of sex when there's no emotional attachment. When sex is seen as an entitlement instead of a pursuit of connection. When sex is owed to a man as a functional job without the contribution to the feminine needs and requirements of a relationship. When a man just wants to receive the act of intercourse. When he wants to be sexually sated without doing the masculine work required for healthy sexuality. He masturbates or hires a prostitute. Just because you're shrouding this intention in the name marriage, it doesn't change the truth of the dynamic that's being lived out. When a man is cleaving only to her body instead of the whole woman, mind, soul, and spirit, all of her femininity, what a man is doing is treating her like a prostitute or dehuman, dehumanizing her to the level of masturbating to an image from porn. When a woman is obligated to duty sex through marriage, it's biologically impossible for her to be aroused. Christianity's teaching on marriage has basically walked wives into a dutiful mindset. You know what that is? It's thinking like a man. So wives believe and follow the masculine paradigm. They give and give and give sex in hopes of getting that relationship attachment and connection. That's how masculinity operates. Men give, then get. Femininity was designed by God as an opposing polarity to masculinity, not to be an equal one. Estrogen was created specifically to not operate the same way. Femininity was created as an embodiment. She receives, then responds. Women get first, then give. A man's sexual arousal is evident, right? The proof that a man doesn't understand femininity is that he thinks his wife's sexuality is exactly like his. It's just hidden inside her body. And you can't see it like you can see his. So when she says no to his sexual advances, he thinks it's because the arousal is there inside her. She's just withholding it from him. Instead of seeing the truth that if a wife's not turned on, it's a signal to him that he hasn't invested into her or their friendship. He hasn't done the work of contributing to the one flesh relationship in order to organically create sexual arousal in his wife's body so that her desire for sex will match his. There's nothing wrong with you, sister. You're not broken. Your body is responding or not responding exactly the way God designed it to. If you don't like sex, I can guarantee your husband isn't cleaving to you. He might be doing things for you, like he does nice things for other people, even other women, like acts of kindness. 
that's not what it means to be cleaved to. If you don't experience his cleaving coming into your heart, that means he's not intentional about chasing you. It means he's not deliberately pursuing you. And that's why you feel nothing coming from him. Because in order to receive his cleave, there has to be something coming from him towards you. All relationships are built on that reciprocal paradigm. It's just different for men than it is for women. I have a video that talks about relational reciprocity. It's called A One Flesh Relationship is About Friendship, Not Function, Part 3. I'll put it in the description box and I'll link it above for you. Nobody had taught me the difference between analyzing in my head and feeling in my heart. I didn't understand that my right way of thinking was to feel first, then analyze. Nobody had taught me how to name the emotions that I was feeling or how to experience. Nobody ever told me that my feelings and emotions are good and that they're part of being female. I had only ever been told to try harder and not cry. Don't be so sensitive. Don't be such a baby. You're so emotional. You're so moody. When a little girl is told to only express happiness and good and positive, and she's only accepted for doing that, she fractures her psyche in order to be protected and fit in and be accepted. A little girl sacrifices her true authentic femininity, which is who she is, for attachment to the primary caregiver so that they will be pleased with her. So what happens is that whenever you experience any feelings or emotions that are not appropriate, you refuse to feel them and you push them down inside instead of feeling your way through them, instead of understanding what they mean and learning how to process and manage them. The unspoken message we hear as little girls is that when we feel feelings, any feelings that are anything different other than happy or nice, any feelings that make people uncomfortable, those are bad and weak. And we internalize that to be, we are bad and weak. And that means there's something wrong with us. So you fake. You pretend you don't feel like you really do. And instead, you pretend that you don't have all of that estrogen inside your body that's busting because it's so full of feelings and emotions so that you can act like a boy who's got very little estrogen. Then that little girl grows up to be a woman and she's thinking like a man now because she's still suppressing all those emotions. And that's dangerous to us because one of the main purposes of all those juicy feelings is for self-protection and guarding our heart. So we continue to feed on breadcrumbs blind to the damage we're causing in our own mind and heart. If you're experiencing disconnection and lack of intimacy and emotional attachment in your marriage, now you have a name for it. It's breadcrumbing. You know you don't like it, but at the same time, you feel powerless to change anything because you don't know what that change should even look like. You know you don't like the feeling, but you've believed that your feelings are not trustworthy. And in the past, as a little girl, they got you shunned or belittled or they embarrassed you. And now in marriage, you're told to live in duty and function, not emotion. Christianity perpetuates the lie that females don't have or need the high levels of emotions that God created them with. Do you see how cruel that is to femininity? A man is told he can still have his primary masculine desire of needing sex. Even though he's now a husband, his masculinity as a man still matters. But the subversive message that Christianity gives to a woman is that her primary feminine desire of needing emotional attachment and connection, that because she's now a wife, her femininity as a woman no longer matters. What that means is that instead of masculinity providing the source for femininity in a relationship, like he did before marriage, now 
all her emotional attachment and connection is expected to be sourced from the duty and function within the role called wife. Her source is now a job description, a dead source, instead of a live masculine creature. If you've ever wondered why sexual desire dies so fast after marriage, that's the answer. Masculinity has ceased cleaving to femininity. If you found value in my content, please tap the subscribe and like button so that we can help more sisters heal their femininity and understand if they're being breadcrumbed in their marriage. Bye for now, and I'll see you in part five.